Hello, and welcome to the Over and Back Classic NBA Podcast. I am Jason, and with me as usual is Rich. Hello, Rich. Hey, how's it going on? Oh, going good. Say, how's it going? Hey, how's, how's it going, going on? It's going, say, on, how's great, it going on. Yeah, <laughs> I, meant to, I, I, I somehow. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. It's a good start to a podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> I'm sure it's our going opening well. was as bad as the Philadelphia 76ers <laughs> was so the second round of the playoffs. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, weird. Story. Right. Nice. Good transition. Yeah. There you go. Save that one. Yeah. So we are talking about uh, some playoff rivalries, uh, some that are uh, truly great playoff rivalries, such as the 76ers and. And the uh, Celtics, who are playing, of course, in this uh, playoffs, and ones that are less storied, such as the Raptors and Cavaliers and, and uh, Pelicans and Warriors. But we're talking about the rivalries or the history of the uh, matchups of these uh, teams that are currently in the conference finals. So uh, some fun stuff to dig into there. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, the, I, the beginning of this episode was an idea of, obviously, let's look at the 76ers and the Celtics. They're kind of renewing their rivalry, so let's kind of dig in that and have some fun. And then it's like, ah, you know, why don't we do these other guys, too? And there's actually been some fun stuff in between these. I mean, obviously, the Raptors and the Cavaliers, we'll, we'll talk about them in a bit. It's not very storied, and, and neither are the Pelicans and the Warriors. But I'm glad we did decide to add everybody else, because the Rockets and Jazz have a pretty, maybe more than you and I even thought. And in our research, I know that you, you had kind of mentioned that as well, and I did, too. I was like, yeah, I, I guess they did face each other, like, a lot uh, in different time periods or whatever. So that'll be kind of fun to dig into them. But uh, yeah, there'll be two that are, are pretty fun, and then the other two are uh, – we'll make them fun, even though there's not a whole lot of history to talk about. But, hey, if it happened a year ago, it's still history, right? It happened two years yeah, ago. That's still history, best. baby. It's, I mean, what happened romantic. yesterday is yeah. history, so we're, we're good mm-hmm. here. We're good. Absolutely, yeah. So, yeah, we uh, – in fact, starting along th- those lines, we'll go to uh, the Raptors and the Cavaliers. Of course, the Raptors have only existed since 1996, and most of that time have not been great. So the uh, uh, the Cavaliers have actually – and the Raptors have only met uh, three times. In fact, the last three years, 2016, 2017, and now 2018 for those listening. The future, we're in 2018 right now. Um, and uh, the, the, the Cavs now have become the Raptors' most frequent playoff opponent in, until – then it would be a tie between the Knicks in 2000-2001, the Nets in, in 2007 and 2014, and then the Wizards in 2015 and, and also 2018. They played them in the first round and beat them. So so yeah, so that's uh, some, some history there, not particularly uh, fascinating history. And yeah, the, the Cavs have um, pretty well owned this series. Um, the uh, They swept in 2017. Uh, Kyle Lowry was injured for the last couple games in that series. And 2016, it was a little closer. You know, obviously the Cavs in the uh, past three seasons have made the finals and have generally had their way in the Eastern Conference. I, I guess the Raptors have probably, in that 2016 series, probably given them one of their better challenges uh, so far, at least in this run. Yeah, absolutely, and we're going to talk about that. In 2017, there's not much to talk about. We'll, we'll mention it at the end here, but you know they got swept in four games, <laughs> so there's not much uh, to talk about. Cavaliers were good, and the Raptors were not as good as the Cavaliers, so there's not much there. But uh, 2016 was actually a pretty fun one, and, and a little bit of background. Uh, the Raptors that year had their first 51 season uh, since they came into the league, so good for them. Uh, they were one of the league's best offenses. They were fifth in offensive rating, and in the top half of defense, they were 11th in uh, uh, defensive rating, and they were also sixth in SRS. So this is arguably the best Raptors team, and, and I would say, you know, obviously now... You this year's team is, is 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 all in all probably a much better team than than the 2016 one. But before that, 2016 was kind of the the crowning achievement of, of this franchise, and and it led to a pretty good playoff series here. Uh, they were a pretty deep team. They had four double digit scores. You had Demar Derozan, and Kyle Lowry, obviously still there. Uh, Jonas Valanciunas, who's still there, but has taken a little bit. You know, I, I don't want, I don't want to say a lesser role, but uh, it's taking a little bit of a back seat. Uh, some other guys have emerged, and a, a real deep bench has emerged. But uh, otherwise, it's it's kind of been the the mantra for the Raptors for a while. There is that sort of deep bench, and Masai Ujiri, who's their uh, their um, you know GM and, and, and top executive, he seems to always kind of pride himself on on rounding out the benches, and, and this team was no exception there. So you had Damari Carroll, who was one of the other uh, double digit scorers. He's obviously moved on, and and it, he's still in the league, right? Or is he not? Yeah, he I, played for the Nets. Actually, he that's right. Oh, well he played year, for the yeah. Nets, which is essentially not in the league. So that's why I forgot. <laughs> oh. but, yeah, sorry, Nets. Hey, sorry. It's, it's sorry Atlanta that's Hawks good. legend there. Let's, let's, <laughs> right? No, let's and then be yeah, careful. No, so. be, be careful how we talk about Damari. No, Carroll. I like Damari Carroll. That's why I was yeah. like, oh, where'd he go? But yeah. no, he's on the he, he actually kind of had a bounce back year, but but okay, that's good. Yeah, but he's still playing. Yeah, I agree. So. <laughs> He's playing for the Nets. So, yeah, <laughs> right. right. I can uh, safely say I watched zero minutes of Nets basketball this year, which uh, is quite uh-huh. the casual. But anyway, uh, those guys were flanked by Terrence Ross, who's, who's obviously moved on. Uh, Luis Scola, who's moved on. Corey Joseph, who's played a big role uh, with Indiana this year. Uh, Patrick Patterson, who obviously moved on to... to um, 
for the franchise as well. Uh, Bismack Biombo, who moved on, and James Johnson, who moved on. So it's actually kind of cool. I mean, a lot of these guys made a lot of money off this season, including like all those guys that I just mentioned, the Ross, uh, Joseph, Patterson, Biombo, and James Johnson all made quite a lot of money uh, by kind of getting resurrected by this team. But uh, yeah, and uh, we also should not forget the 19 games they got from former first overall pick Anthony Bennett. Uh, how could you forget those 19 games that uh, Anthony Bennett gave? I think he averaged like one point a game, so he probably doesn't matter. But um, anyway, they made franchise history on May 1st, 2006, because this was when the Raptors defeated the Indiana Pacers in Game 7 of the first round of the NBA playoffs. The Raptors having trouble in the first round is no ex- is, is a constant thing that has been going on for quite a few years. And uh, this was actually the only second playoff victory in franchise history and the first in a seven-game series. They obviously made it to the conference semifinals in 2001. They had the great duel with uh, Allen Iverson and Vince Carter. That was obviously when the, the NBA still in the first round had five games. So this is their first win in a seven-game series and the only second time they've actually won a series in their franchise history. Um in the semifinals, the Raptors uh, defeated the third seed Miami Heat. Tough game, a seven-game series. So two straight seven-game series for the Raptors here. And um, this was the first time that obviously the franchise had made it to the Eastern Conference Finals. And they met the Cavaliers. And unfortunately, they fell. But they gave them a pretty good fight in six games. Uh, quick little recaps here. Games one and two. Easy victories to the Cavs. Um, the Cavs at this point had pushed their... They had a playoff win streak of ten games in a row at this point. And uh, we'll get to that here in a little bit because that is significant for some history as well. But uh, So they, they, they pushed that to ten games over in the games one and two. Uh, a little bit of background about this Cavs team. We've just kind of been talking about the Raptors. We'll go into the Cavs here a little bit. Uh, Cavs finished the season with 57 wins, uh, but there was turmoil, of course. This was the David Blatt season. Uh, everybody remembers David Blatt, right? Uh, he was fired after 41 games, and he was replaced by uh, their still current coach, uh, former NBA point guard Tyron Liu, who went 27-14, uh, and 14, uh, replacing Blatt on the year. Uh, the Cavs were fourth in SRS, third in offensive rating, and tenth in defensive rating. They were led by, of course, LeBron James, uh, who had 25.3 points per game that year, 7.4 rebounds per game, and eight point, or 6.8 assists, rather. Uh, also, Kyrie Irving, uh, just under 20 points per game. Kevin Love, around 16 a game. Uh, Jared Smith, 12.4 points per game. Uh, additional role players, not great. Uh, 33-year-old Mo Williams, who's uh, you know tagging along with uh, LeBron for a little bit there. Uh, Tristan Thompson and Matthew Delavadova as well were kind of the other guys. And it wasn't, uh, I guess this Cavs team is currently not that deep. And this one wasn't all that deep either. But, I mean, obviously still had uh, Kyrie there. Uh, Jared Smith was still at the peak of his powers. And Tristan Thompson was starting to emerge as well. So uh, a good little duo there. Um, back to the series uh, as a whole. Game three, uh, the Raptors did finally win. Uh, DeMar DeRozan had 32. Bismack Biombo got a franchise record 26 rebounds. Uh, Dwayne Casey said it's a long series. It's not over yet, but everybody thought we were going to get swept. I think that fuels us, and if that's what it takes, so be it. Uh, the significance of this game, though, Cavs lose, uh, so that ends their playoff win streak. They were attempting to match uh, the Los Angeles record, uh, the Los Angeles Lakers' then record of 11 straight victories to begin a postseason. The Lakers did that in 1989, and then again in 2001. Uh, 2001. And then, of course, that was broken uh, the following year by the Golden State Warriors, but uh, well, that'd be a topic for another day. Possibly uh, Game 4, Raptors guard Kyle Lowry scores 20 first-half points. They tie the series at two apiece. Uh, DeMar DeRozan said, we've been counted out, and we like that challenge. This was Cleveland. Uh, so Cleveland lost consecutive playoff games to an Eastern Conference opponent for the first time since dropping the final three games of the conference semifinals to Boston in 2010. So there's a lot of weird stuff in that, but essentially since LeBron came back, they didn't lose to Eastern Conference teams, and they never lost consecutive games until this point. So it's a pretty big deal. Uh, LeBron James, after the game, says going back home, we have to play a lot better, and I think we will. And he was right, because the Cavs won the next two games, uh, and then they won the series in six, and they went on to win an NBA title. Um, a little bit of background about this uh, th- this year, of course. So this marked the sixth consecutive season that LeBron James was in the, and in the NBA Finals. And, of course, we should mention it was not alone. He had his partner in crime there the whole time. James Jones also had his sixth consecutive NBA Finals. So yeah. um, the real the real leader of the team is the real the real James that runs the show there, James Jones, of course. Uh, absolutely, yeah, James Jones. Yeah. I, I completely forgot that Mo Williams is on that uh, team. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah. Yeah, I did Bruce Channing Fry was there, <laughs> Richard Jefferson, uh, Matthew Della Vadova, Mon Shepard, and, and Timothy Mozgov. That, that was, this was the year after. After Mozgov was really relevant on the team, this was when he was uh, barely playing. That that was a huge uh, fall, a very quick uh, amount yes, of time. Right. So, well, hey, it's he got paid a lot of money. Yeah. So go yeah. go to the Mozgov. I don't know. The yeah. Also, an, on the next now, we want some of that. So, <laughs> a yeah. lot of that. So, All right. Us, um, yes. So when they win the title, obviously the Cavs, uh, they were uh, looking to end the 52-year championship drought, uh, the longest of any city with at least three professional teams. Uh, no uh, Cleveland team had won it all since the Browns uh, won uh, the NFL championship in 1964. So good for the Cavaliers. They finally did it. Uh, James became the eighth player in NBA history to appear in six consecutive finals and the first who didn't play for the Boston Celtics. I always liked that little caveat there that it was always like, you know, yeah, he's the first to do this, except for the Celtics because all those guys did because they were all really great. Right. And... Um, 
in well, a, some of them were a little lucky, but yes. But, right, but of course. The, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So, they all played with Bill Russell, so yeah. yeah right, the, right. The, the, right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Some didn't quite earn it nearly as much. But, uh, right. So that's yeah. why they had to put that caveat, because it's like, you, you know, some of these guys are, were, you know, are not on yeah. the same level here. But uh, uh, so when they, upon winning this, uh, great J.R. Smith quote here. So clutching the Eastern Conference Trophy, this is from an ESPN article, uh, clutching the Eastern Conference Trophy in his arms, Smith broke up his teammates' postgame pref- press conference by joking, can we go, this thing is kind of heavy. J.R. Smith, everybody. J.R. Smith, everybody. <laughs> there you go. Uh, 2017, sure yeah. as we mentioned, not that exciting. Uh, Cavs swept Toronto. Uh, LeBron James scored uh, exactly 35 points in three of the four games. He scored 39 in the other. That's all I have about that series. That's the only fun fact I could find about it. So, um, Yeah, not uh, like somebody, uh, Kyle Lowry, but I think was hurt in the uh, final two games mm-hmm. of that uh, series. So, yeah, not really. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, the Raptors kind of brought together most of the same squad. But their depth wasn't quite as good uh, in 2016. And it's gotten a lot better this year, as you talked about, with, you know, kind of uh, bringing up some of the guys off their bench. Uh, you know, Fred Van Fleet, for one, for instance, and you know, a couple of the guys. So, um, yeah, it'll be, of course, you know, we're, we're in the midst of it right um, now. You know, the the, the fact that, um, you know, the, the Raptors seem to have a decent chance of, you know, w- w- Winning this, uh, winning the series, and you know, ending the ca- ending their their curse or whatever you might say against the Cavs, and ending you know LeBron's uh, you know uh, final streak, ending at seven in a row, which is obviously pretty amazing. So uh, you know, it, we'll, we'll we'll see whether it happens, but certainly I, I think this is certainly the best chance that they have to uh, to do it for sure. Yeah, no, and it, it feels the most vulnerable that, that a LeBron team has felt in, in, in almost a decade, really. I mean, until like maybe his his original stints in, in Cleveland. And there was always, you know, there was always the worry of like, oh, what's going to happen come finals time? But it always felt like the Cavs, uh, since he came back there with, with Love and Kyrie or whatever, that it was almost preordained that they would find a way into the NBA Finals. And I don't know that there was ever a worry, but I feel like this is the first year where it's like, oh, okay, they, I don't know. <laughs> like, I there's there's definitely doubt in the mind. And, and Toronto being as good as they are, and, and you know, obviously Boston and Philly, uh, both, both, we'll talk about them here in a sec. Both, you know, bo- both some pretty good teams as well. It feels like for the first time, there's a real threat to, to LeBron sort of dominance of the Eastern Conference. So, uh, speaking of uh, Boston and uh, Philly, our uh, our next venture is uh, those teams, the 76ers and the Celtics. Of course, 76ers were originally the Syracuse Nationals, and uh, they had a rivalry in the um, in the early 50s and in the early part of the Russell era uh, from 57 to 69. Uh, we've done shows uh, talking about uh, the uh, th- these matchups, so we won't get into so- too much depth there. We'll, we'll link to those in the show notes if you want to go back and listen to those episodes, but uh, uh, in the uh, early 50s, before Bill Russell came along, uh, the um, they had four playoff series, four years in a row, actually, for 53 to 56. The Celtics won the uh, first uh, two games to zero, and then the Nationals won the uh, next three series. Um, and in uh, 55, the Nationals actually, or 54, the Nationals went to the finals, and 55, they actually won the finals. So um, it, at this point, you know, the Celtics were a good team. Obviously, they're making the playoffs, and they usually had a good record, but their their Achilles heel was their defense. They just were not a particularly good uh, defensive uh, team. And the Nationals were, you know, pretty well balanced. They had Dolph Shays, obviously, but they had, you know, a lot of good players. You know, Paul Seymour. Uh, they got Red Kerr toward the end of that. It was a good center, so they were they had the advantage there until Bill Russell came along and obviously changed everything. Yeah, no, that's uh, <laughs> changed the whole dichotomy of this entire. Um you know, rivalry here. So 1956, obviously the last year of glory for the Syracuse Nationals. Uh, Celtics trade for Bill Russell. They draft his University of San Francisco teammate, Sam Jones. Um, and they're off and running. So they, uh, they play each other 57, 59, 61, 65, 66, 67, 68, and 69. Of course, we're not going to break down every single one of those series because that would take us quite a long amount of time. And I feel like we've done that at numerous points, but, uh, all you have to know is Celtics won the next three playoff series. They won in 57, 59, and 61. Uh, Celtics, of course, won their franchise's the first title in 1957. They take a one-year break in 1958 losing in the NBA Finals and then they'd have eight straight so things went pretty well for Boston not so great for Syracuse the Nationals and, and that entire franchise though yeah, they uh, they lasted until the uh, until sixty three, and then moved to uh, Philadelphia to become the seventy sixers. It was just a year after uh, the Warriors left Philadelphia to go to San Francisco. So uh, they so Philly got another team and eventually traded for uh, Wilt Chamberlain. And we and we've talked about before what kind of an interesting mix of like Philly guys and also old Syracuse Nationals guys who had been the rivalry for the Philadelphia Warriors in the past. So there was a little bit of lack of acceptance for uh, following the team. All 
although a once book came along that that did better um yeah and you know as we talked about the uh, early on in the 60s or late 70s early 60s the Celtics won those series and then they started to get closer in 65 the Celtics barely won the that series four games to three that's the, that's the famous Havlicek steals the ball uh, series mm-hmm. in uh, game seven where you know he uh, he took a Chet Walker pass and was able to uh, to take the ball and able to steal that one they did win pretty handily in the 66 playoffs but 67 was the uh, turning point where um, the uh, Alex Hannum was brought in as coach and uh, Wilt st- played more of a distributor type role and more of a defensive and less being the offensive focal point, at least in terms of taking more of the shots. They were a much more balanced team with uh, Billy Cunningham coming along with, you know, Hal Greer playing great, uh, Chet Walker playing great and, um, and, you know, a a really deep team. So they had, they had a lot of good players uh, going on uh, there. And yeah, this was obviously, you know, the biggest moment in Wilt's career, at least at this point, you probably honestly the biggest moment in his career over Overall, maybe the 72 Lakers, you could throw that in there as well, of course. But yeah, they were the the 76ers were probably the you know the, the best single season team that the NBA had ever seen up until that point. They were just obviously um, incredibly awesome, and, and finally ending that eight game winning streak or eight eight year winning streak rather of finals is uh, you know it, it, incredible. And um, it, you, one thing I thought about today that I don't think we'd ever talked about before is I think it's for for me. The fact that Wilt and the Sixers were not able to beat the Celtics again, the, the fact that Russell was able to come back and win in 68 and 69 even makes that even a little more special in a weird way because of the fact that they they had to – if, you know, the 76ers had won there and then the Celtics never won again, you could just kind of say, oh, well, you know, they, they finally got too old and they finally beat them and, you know, Russell wasn't at his best. But the fact that Russell, you know, came back and won those last two years, even if he wasn't quite at his best, he still demonstrated that they could, you know, win there and that, that making that 67 win even more special and unique in a way. Yeah, and I think as well as it showed that that you know in, in a way like if if we talk about oh they won like you know fourteen straight title like if they never lost the you know and we we talked about this before if you know, obviously you know they they win in fifty seven if they had lo- you know won again in fifty eight then railed off eight straight and then beat the seventy then it's almost like I, I don't even know what the NBA is at that point anymore because I feel like you needed those a few little hope years in there like obviously you had your eight straight and that was like the dominant one but it was it was a nice break that you had a few other teams pop up here and there and show that hey look another team you can beat the Celtics they are mortal but then like you said then they proved the next two years. Nah, we're we're pretty immortal here. We're just gonna win the next two as well. I I, I like that because it almost makes them. I, I don't know the the, the correct way to, to put it, but I think you're you're kind of on the right path there. Where it's just like they they would be so ridiculous, and and obviously they still are ridiculous, but it would be so ridiculous they won like 13 straight. But you have those two that kind of break it up a little bit, the two that kind of make it a little bit, and then but it proves that they still the resilience of that team, and that, and then like you said that that you know you couldn't just say okay, well that's it. They had their eight in a row, that was a great run, but now the, it's time for a new NBA, you know, with Wilt and the 76ers. But then they just come back the next two years and win, and especially you know in '68 taking it to seven games and making it so dramatic as well um, in, in the conference finals. Like against the 76ers just makes it that much more special and shows that they were kind of there to go so no I, I agree I think it's it, it's fun to have those little blips that that make the uh, make everything in between those blips that much more special I think yeah definitely yeah um so you know, one series that kind of gets lost in the shuffle a little bit because you know the the 60s series are talked about a lot you know Wilt Russell obviously the great rivalry at that time and then the um and the 80s series talked a lot about, which we'll get into a little bit here. But uh, one that kind of, you know, is missing, which I think is really interesting, is the 77 Eastern Conference semifinals. And this is the first, you know, this is the merger season. So it's the obviously the ABA players have gone into the NBA. Dr. J is there and so forth as he joined the Philadelphia 76ers coming out of the ABA. And the... It's sort of an old NBA versus a new NBA. You know, the the Boston Celtics are the standard bearers. They've won two out of the last three championships. You know, they have, you know, Mr. NBA, John Havlicek, you know, uh, Dave Cowens, Jojo White. I mean, all these all these great players. They, they play kind of in this certain system. They, they play for, you know, Red Arbach, their general manager, who is, you know, very, you know, kind of anti-modern, anti-ABA, you know, all that, very kind of vocally disparaging of the ABA. And then you have, you know, the, the Phillies, kind of a mix of the old, you know, ABA personalities. They obviously Irving, George McGinnis, and they've got guys who, you know, maybe belong there in spirit, like, you know, Warby Free, Daryl Dawkins, you know, guys like that. They're, they're just a, a collection of a little bit of misfits, you know, really talented guys who, um, you know, were uh, not afraid to shoot the ball. They, 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 you know, they weren't, obviously this, they weren't an ABA team in fact, but they were an ABA team, perhaps in spirit. Um, so 
this is just sort of an interesting contract of styles. Um, you know, the Celtics at that point, you know, they were 44 and 38 there, but they had a, only a 36 win differential that year. They were 17th out of 22 uh, in the league in terms of SRS. So they were definitely on the way down. You know, um, Havlicek at that point was, you know, 36. Uh, you know, Jojo White was 30. You know, most of the other guys were actually, you know, in their late to mid 20s. So they weren't necessarily a super old team. Um, but obviously, you know, two of their best players were over 30. So, and, and Havlicek, you know, he ageless and tireless, but it was coming to the end for him despite him still being a pretty effective player. Um, yeah, and the really weird thing about the season is, is Dave Cowens actually only played 15 games that year because he took a two leave, av- leave of, two month leave of absence during that time and uh, actually worked as a cab driver and just kind of just was really burned out from basketball. It was like he might actually retire. It was a, a very, uh, very strange situation. Yeah, that's uh, that's really odd. <laughs> Especially going to the ca- like doing the cat, like like not just go home and like not do anything and not you know just go home and try to clear your mind, but like go home and then become a cab driver, which I, yeah. that seems more stressful than, than being an NBA <laughs> right. player. Yeah. But I guess I mean go for it. I uh, I mean maybe you need a little extra money. I don't know. Maybe they've had gambling debts or something. I I don't know. Oh, we I, did, but no, it's definitely. Uh, <laughs> I, I assure you, I do not have any information on uh, the uh, potential gambling debts. All right, of, uh, don't but, sue no, us, I mean, Dave Collins, please. Yeah, what, yeah, the one thing that you were mentioning too with the, the team, you know. You know, the expected win percentage or the expected win loss percentage, you know, 36 and 46, they, you know, definitely outplayed that way going, you know, finishing with 44 wins. A lot of the numbers, too, I mean, they're not a great team at any, like, you know, they're 17th in, in points per game, 12th in, in opponents' points per game, 17th in SRS. Like, there's just nothing that jumps out of the page about this team. It, it seems like a team that should, should not have been as good as they were and, and definitely should not have, you know, maybe even went as long as they did in the playoffs. And, and we'll talk about them here in a bit. But yeah, it's like, you know, yeah, they're just uh, it seems so foreign to see this the, uh, Boston team that just wasn't good. You know what I mean? It, it's just like it's just a very very average, like a painfully average Celtics team, and that was not normal for them. Right. Yeah. And this was the, sort of the the end of really you know, they, they were going to really fall off again in the next season, which was Havlicek last year. Um, and obviously they would take a couple years to rebuild before they would bring in Larry Bird, and everything would change. But it was like um, two damn years of spoiled ass Celtics. Right. <laughs> like, exactly. Like oh, yes. we suck. Oh, I know we're great again. Sorry. Never mind. <laughs> we're we're back. Yes. Like we're good. We're good. We lost we lost fifty games twice. Now now we're good again. Sorry. We're good. Yeah. Sorry. We're back. Yeah. So, so they they did uh, they beat the Spurs in the first round, by the way, to get this this uh, second round. Uh, so, an a former ABA team there, um, yeah. So, and we going to we'll talk a little bit more about their players specifically here, but we'll get into Philly a little bit. Uh, they were fifty and thirty two. They were third in the NBA and SRS, tied for second in wins. This was from seventy seven to seventy nine or so. The after the merger, the uh, the win totals are uh, you know, the highest win totals are like in the low fifties generally. The lowest win totals are like in the high twenties. So there's a very uh, unusual compression of records. And I guess a lot of that's probably talent dis- distribution. Uh, some of it may also be the travel schedule changed and there's more. Um, you're, you're playing each team four times, basically. So you're traveling, you know, further distances more often. So I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that probably had an impact as well. But um Anyway, yeah, it's, it's a little bit of a weird series. Uh, Doug Collins and Julius Irving each averaged 23.7 points per game, and Collins actually averaged more minutes, slightly more minutes, and had a better field goal percentage, 55 to 46, than uh, Irving did. So he struggled a little bit on uh, this series, and it took him a little while to totally get back to himself uh, fitting in on these Sixers teams. Like I said, there's a lot of guys who were taking a lot of shots, whereas, you know, he was really, you know, I mean, he you know he had, he had good teammates who could score on the Nets as well, but this was really a collection of guys and he was, you know, to to maybe to a fault, trying to kind of fit in more, and you know was was not playing inside as much as he was used to because they had McGinnis and you know Carbo Jones and other guys who you know were were, were big guys, Dawkins right. who were you know to kind of taking up that space. So, um, and Robbie Free had a really interesting series. He averaged fifteen point three points per game in twenty point three minutes per game on thirty eight percent field goal percentage. So, <laughs> <laughs> getting his Robbie Free getting his, I like it. Yeah, but he he comes through especially in a game seven, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Yeah, George McGinnis also shot thirty. 38% with, uh, although he did a 15.6 points per game, 11.7 rebounds per game, but yeah, that, uh, the shooting percentage, not, uh, not, not strong for those guys. Um, and yeah, talking about the Celtics again, yeah, they really did not, they had very, very little depth on this team. They really only had six guys who were playing, you know, Cowan, Tavlicek, White, you know, Charlie Scott, Sidney Wicks, and Curtis Rowe were, you know, basically everyone else, you know, there were, the other guys played, you know, less than five minutes a game or so. I mean, they, they really had very little, and obviously, you know, just tend to tighten in the playoffs, but I, I think even, you know, more than, than is usual, the Celtics uh, did that, especially uh, this season. 
Yeah, and if you if you go look and look at the roster, even the regular season, I mean, there, there's a good chance that even the most you know <laughs> person that's in most in tune you know with with, with basketball history, you, there's going to be like six guys on that bench that you're just like I, I don't really know that much about you know <laughs> Kevin Stakeham and Steve Karitsky, like you know what I mean? Like it's yeah. just, it's a collection of not. I mean, and, and we're so used yeah. to again like Boston just having so many guys they can they can go to and obviously yeah like you said the playoffs come and and you probably only put your best you know seven or eight guys out there but still even if they had their best seven or eight i mean that's pretty much what they had in the regular season as well and so it just yeah it was uh not a not a great team not a, a really deep team either on, on any level and, and and definitely getting old i mean with Havlicek becoming you know he's 36 years old at this point and the young players there's not really any like dynamic young players ready to take over for him i mean dave Collins to an extent at 28 but as we can see he's sort of conflicted about what he's you know his future one not jojo white's already 30 you know charlie scott's 28 like no, no super young guy ready to sort of take over and, and become that next you know Boston Celtics legend at this point. Yeah, and the Sixers, you know, we we talked about some of the guys. Obviously, uh, obviously Irving um, and McGinnis and uh, Doug Collins would be free. Also, Henry Bibby, uh, Steve Mex, uh, Caldwell Jones, and Daryl Dawkins, uh, Joe Bryant, Joe Jellybean Bryant, uh, Kobe's dad, also on the team, although he did not play much in this series, only thirteen minutes in two games, so uh, not really involved as much here. Um, and you know, the, the highlights of the series, uh, you know, really the the. It was not particularly close for most of the games. Although game one, uh, Jojo White did hit a big game winner in Philly, and it was interesting. He it's about six seconds left, and he misses a you know what was essentially a floater from about the free throw line on the right side, and then he it, it misses badly, and then the rebound ends up basically getting tapped to him, and he made a a baseline jumper as he's practically falling out of bounds, uh, and uh, for the game winner, it's a pretty dramatic a shot, and, and that was obviously a big shot. Uh, you know that was in Philly, that was uh, you know. To Took, took momentum in the uh, series. I'm, I'm sure you know made things tight, and you know it w- went basically back and forth. Philly won the uh, next two games in the uh, series, and then uh, Dave Cowens had a huge game four to uh, 37 points, 21 rebounds to, uh, to to tie the series, uh, and then Philly won game uh, five, and Boston won game six, both at home, and then we went to game seven, and uh, it was a very low scoring game. Uh, teams did not uh, shoot very well, and uh, it was really. Uh, uh, Warby Free, who was able to, uh, you know, um, make it in there and uh, was able to, uh, he came off the bench in the third quarter, was tied at 56, and uh, he, he uh, after he missed his first six shots of the game, he uh, managed to score 27 points to uh, take uh, Philly into the conference finals. Uh, Dave Cowan to 27 points in that game, so, uh, so he, he certainly did his part, but yeah, the Warby Free ends up uh, taking over and bringing, uh, bring, bringing the uh, Sixers this is the um, this is only the second loss in a game seven for the Celtics in their uh, history. They've not really had uh, uh, that many, of course, uh, along the lines. They've had a great uh, game seven uh, record, and yeah, really, uh, all, the only other players who scored double figures for the Sixers in that game were Irving with fourteen. He was six out of nineteen shooting, and Doug Collins with ten. So, uh, you know, it, without would be free, they would have definitely uh, 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 that he he definitely saved their bacon on that that occasion. Absolutely, yeah, and see, we, we were kind of laughing at his his gunner mentality, but here it is, you know, it worked out. He lost his, he missed his first yeah. six and was like, that doesn't, that doesn't stop me at all. Let's keep going, let's go. And yeah. yeah, he was, he was really 10 of, it. He was 10 of 27 in the uh, game. So. <laughs> well, you got to shoot your shot to make it, right? I mean, yeah, can't, hey. Can't make it if you don't shoot, but uh, yeah, no, this is, uh, it's an ugly yeah. game. Like, yeah, Bad, yeah, wow. 30, yeah, so. 30% shooting, 27 turnovers, I mean, just a, the midway through the third quarter, midway tied to 56. I mean, that's, and, and especially in this era, I mean, this wasn't an era, if, if this was 1998, like, I'd, I'd be like, oh, yeah, whatever that's you know pretty right. normal miami heat knicks game but no this was definitely not an era where that you know 56 midway through the third was something you would you would regularly see particularly not with you know a, a pretty well powered you know sixers team as well yeah. gosh yeah jojo white shot 7 of 24 have a check 4 of 19 cowens 5 of 16 so uh yeah <laughs> not good uh yeah. curtis row 5 of 9 so that was that was yeah, good so give me more uh, he, he's the only guy in this game who shot over 50 percent oh, <laughs> well carl jones shot one of one <laughs> so <laughs> but other than that wow <laughs> anyway so yeah, yeah I, mean, I, I don't I it was dramatic <laughs> yeah <laughs> it was i close. don't yeah. yeah, I don't know if there's video of that game, but I don't know if we want to see that one. Maybe no, just I don't really free want highlights. to. Yeah, I, yeah. Don't, uh, I just yeah. ate, so I don't want to. I don't want to <laughs> you guys miss so much shots. But uh, uh, so we pick up the, uh, the, the the rivalry, I guess. Uh, a few years later, 1980, they they pick it back up, and then they have a, a quite few years: 1980, 81, 82, 85. Um, 
meet uh, obviously four times here. Uh, Celtics prevailed in uh, 81 and 85. The Sixers prevailed in 1980 and 82. Um, great game, uh, great seven game series in 1981. That's one pretty famous as well. The Sixers were up 3 uh, 1. Celtics scratched and clawed in close games, winning three straight to take the series 4 uh, 3. Celtics would then gain a berth in the 81 finals and they would defeat Houston and that'd be their first title uh, in five years as well. So kind of uh, get them back to the, as we said, they had their, their few years of bad and now they're back. That's yeah, five years since we won a championship. Oh, God. Like, how can we survive? But uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, 1982, the Sixers obviously got the revenge. They almost did blow a 3 1 lead. And, and this kind of uh, an interesting part here the Sixers, they won in seven games. Uh, most famous part of this game, though, probably more than anything, uh, is nothing that happened on the court. It's that the, um, you know, Sixers, uh, the Celtics knew that the Sixers were winning. They had a command of it. So the Boston Garden started chanting Beat LA, the famous Beat LA chant, uh, and words of encouragement for the rival Sixers. Hey, you're going to go to the NBA Finals. You're going to face the LA Lakers. We hate the Lakers. So you know what? Even though we just, we kind of hate you, we hate the Lakers more. So why don't you go there and beat LA? Uh, and Daryl Dawkins, uh, his quote after the game said, Man, when I heard that, my dick got stiff. So, yeah. Chocolate Thunder Bay. Wait, with words he had. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> anyway, yes. So, um, so yeah, the, uh, you can't really beat that one. Yeah. No, th- that's, that's, uh, the show's over. We're done. Yeah. All right. See you. Yeah. See you next week. So, yeah. And we've delved into, um, uh, you, and in some of our Dr. J shows, we, we kind of delved into, you know, we, Curtis Harris and I uh, talked about some of the, uh, got, got into these series in more depth, so we got some stuff. That's why we're not digging into it too deeply um, here, because the, obviously that's uh, uh, been, been uh, I've said pretty well trod uh, territory. There's some, there's some great stuff there, some really exciting games. And yeah, I, I think 81 is up there in, you know, if you consider some of the greatest playoff series ever, 81 is definitely on the very short list of, you know, uh, of greatest NBA playoff series. I, I would I would say for sure yeah no definitely yeah yeah the 85 is you know, that's pretty much the end for the uh sixers um I, I believe moses malone missed that series so um and, and i think andrew tony was hurt as well so they, they didn't really necessarily have a great uh chance in that one yeah that's one that went pretty handily four to one you know irving was uh you know showing his age the, the 85 team was probably the last you know really good sixers team uh they should they weren't too bad in 86 as well but the, the celtics obviously 86 were a dominant team so they didn't really have much of a shot there that was got you know, barkley come in uh and and bolstered them a little bit, but obviously their core guys were, you know, getting pretty old, and there wasn't, uh, you know, much more that they were going to be able to uh, do after that point. Yeah, and, and you could see it in the fact that, you know, obviously we mentioned that it was over after '85. Like they didn't have, you know, a bunch of other ones after that. It would be quite a while until these these teams would even meet in the playoffs again. Cel- Celtics, of course, have a few more years of relevance up into the early '90s, and for the Sixers, uh, I'd be a while <laughs> until they were relevant again. A long while. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I kind of forgot about this one. 2002. Um, the, uh, the Celtics, uh, won in the first round a three to two. This is, uh, you know, uh, of course the, the Paul Pierce, uh, Antoine Walker Celtics battling the Allen Iverson Sixers a year after they had made the finals and, um, you know, obviously lost to the finals to Lakers after, uh, Iverson's MVP series, uh, season rather. Um, yeah. And this was, um, you know, th- this was, yeah, this was the first Celtics first playoff appearance in 1999. Uh, this was the Celtics' first playoff appearance since 1995, so it had been you know, quite a quite a while since they, you know, especially for the considering the Celtics' record, it was probably their longest uh, playoff streak, I would imagine. And um, you know, not necessarily like the most exciting series ever, but you know, some some interesting things there in terms of uh, you know the, the the Celtics were kind of a surprise that year to make it to the uh, uh, conference finals, considering they hadn't really had you know uh, they'd been okay the last couple of years, but you know, nothing special. You know, in the Eastern Conference was a little weak that that year. So so maybe a little bit asterisk on that Eastern Conference Finals appearance, but hey, you know they'll, they'll take it. I'm sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, it's definitely a weird. Um, I mean, yeah, and they almost made it to the NBA Finals. Actually, I mean, it was obviously they, they lost in six games to the Nets, but uh, it was a very winnable series. It wasn't like the, you know it was a real tough thing for them. So it's just yeah, it's kind of nuts that this team and you, you look at it and, and and this particular Boston team and you have Paul Pierce, you have Anton Walker, and that's it. Like you have no, you have 31 year old Kenny Anderson who's who's fine. You have you know Eric Strickland, Tony Delk, Tony Batty, a very young Joe Johnson, Walter McCarty. Like this team is bad, but the East is really bad at this point. So the East is very winnable. For, for a lot of teams and that's uh, you know it, in a lot of ways led to, to kind of this resurrection of the Sixers and and I guess you know in, in, in a pretty apt thing is you know the Sixers and the, and the Celtics kind of got back to relevancy based off this you know pretty weak Eastern Conference and, and, and kind of emerged again but uh, yeah it's uh, it's kind of nuts that it would take you know 17 years for these teams to, to face off again after playing each other so many times but uh, yeah given the state of both teams and, and particularly the Celtics throughout the 90s it, it, it's not too uh, crazy but yeah the um 
you know, the, so we had the 2002, obviously. Then it would be another 10 years again until uh, we would see these guys again. That's 2012 Eastern Conference semifinals. Oh, sorry. Oh, just before we get to that, I wanted to just see if you could guess who the second leading scorer for the Sixers was uh, in this uh, in oh, this series my in 2002. God. Okay, all right, all right. So this is 2002. Yes, Philadelphia 76ers. Oh God. Um, I hope it wasn't Aaron McKee, was it? Uh, no, but though he was close, okay. uh, he was fourth, and he the the the, the uh, second through four were all actually second through five were all fairly close to each other. Oh man. Um, Shoot, I, it could have been Eric, Eric Snow's in there, but he's not. Uh, he's not number two, I don't think. Actually, he's number three. So he's. Oh uh, man, yeah. I got one more to go. Who the hell yeah. is on this team? Who was the? Yeah. Oh, it's it's somebody that's like definitely not that good, right? Uh, he wasn't at this point. Although at one point he was pretty good. <sighs> okay. Oh man, who was on? <laughs> Corey Blunt? No, I don't. I don't. I don't remember who was on this Corey, team. Corey Blunt was actually on the team, although he only had one point four points. <laughs> Michael Ruffin uh, for Curtis Harris. Uh, it was Michael Ruffin, obviously. Not, not Michael Ruffin. It was a uh, Derek Coleman. Oh my god, thirty-four year old Derek oh. Coleman. I, I forgot he was still on the Sixers at this point. Uh, yeah. I know he. Yeah, he joined them in ninety-seven or ninety-eight or so. But yeah, so he twelve point eight points. Uh, Eric Snow ten point eight. Aaron McKee uh, ten point six, and Matt Harpering uh, ten point two. Uh, Mac- See, Matumbo at eight point eight. So I'd have to here. I'm, I'm going to click around. If I remember correctly, Coleman left and then came back. Okay, yeah, no, he did. So he. Oh, that, yeah. that's right. Because that makes sense. Because I was like, I don't think he was on the, the the finals team. No, he went to Charlotte for three years and then came back to Philly to. Uh, oh eat, man, I, eat all the I food, to eat all the completely forgot about Charlotte Hornets. Yeah, uh, that's, Derek Coleman. Yeah, that was looking forward to on uh, on 20 years ago. So <laughs> right, yes. Wow, the Derek yeah. Coleman Hornets experience. But uh, yeah. yeah, that's um, okay. <laughs> I forgot yeah. about that too. So there you go. There you go. Yeah. Derek Coleman. Oh, fun times. Um, yeah, I don't want to say that. So I'm sorry. Cummings. Get, get, what a, Fontigo Cummings. That's, oh, yeah. What a squad. <laughs> God, the East was so bad. God, it was not Jeez. good. It was not ideal. This yeah. team was like the, one of the crowded yeah. teams of the East, like the third best team, the second best team of the East. The yeah. Sixers team. Vontigo Cummings. He didn't do anything. I'm yeah. just saying Vontigo Cummings. Right. It's kind of fun, but uh, yeah. But by the way, the uh, the Celtics had already traded Joe Johnson by the time of this playoff series. But he, he did play with them during the season. But he oh, right, 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 yeah, 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 dur- yeah. early in the season. So I don't know why I get any corrections on that. No, so. no, yeah, definitely not. Yeah. No, people on. Are you kidding? People on podcast no. wouldn't correct. Yeah, no, of course not. <laughs> right, do, all right. Um, so as I mentioned, no, do you want me to pick up the 2012, or do you want to take? Yes, it? Yes, absolutely. No, you 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 got it, Rich. Okay, I have. This is a very you know spirited thing here. So the rivalry would of course be renewed ten years later. So, Celtics, Sixers, 2012. Uh, very different circumstances here. Boston was kind of in the final stages of their big three era, obviously with, with Ray Allen, Gun Garnett, uh, Paul Pierce. Um, well, the Sixers, they took Boston to seven games. They were a real scrappy team that many thought kind of lucked into the semifinals. Of course, they won in the first round uh, due to an injury to uh, Bulls guard Derrick Rose. Uh, the Sixers were an eighth seed, and god damn, they almost beat the Celtics. They took them to the semifinals. They would have made a conference finals berth as an eighth seed. Um, and the Sixers run, and, and, and obviously their near berth in the conference finals, uh, probably would have been the biggest playoff upset run, I don't know, since the eight seeded Knicks in the 99 finals. And, and that one I don't really quite count. I don't know. Where do you stand? on that because people always bring them up and I, I kind of don't want to count them in any of those because it was like the way because of the lockout they weren't like your normal eight seed team but where, where do you stand on on Knicks 99 and 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 maybe on, on yeah, what level this would have been of an upset uh, yeah no I that's those are both interesting questions I mean yeah I would say that it's a little bit yeah 99 is a little bit of odd year because that team was if I recall started off really poorly and then came together and was playing much a lot better it was a little bit like the Warriors in 07 were over like the last 15, 20 games. The Warriors actually were really awesome. And so, you know, the fact that they, you know, beat Dallas wasn't really as much of a surprise in retrospect as it, or, you know, it, you know, it's a little more of a surprise, less of a surprise than it was. I don't know. Never mind. You get what I'm saying, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. So words not so good for me right there. But anyway, um, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I've thought a whole lot about it, but this would be certainly up there. I mean, you would think maybe like the 81, um, you know, the Rockets and Kings, you know, having the up set over the Lakers and Suns mm-hmm. uh, those years. I mean, that, that, that would be pretty big. Um, you know, that, that would be up there. I, um, you know, the Grizzlies uh, beating, you know, the uh, the Spurs when they were an eight seed versus a one seed. So I, I, it feels like that's happened a lot <laughs> recent, more recently than, uh, you know, of course, that it had uh, previously. Um, so it's not quite as much of a, you know, not, not quite as much of a shock anymore, I guess. Um, but, yeah, this was definitely a... Um, it was it was an odd team. I mean, they you know they obviously they draw a young you know he was really effective at that point. They had uh, Andre Iguodala, but yeah, they had uh, in this series they had um, 
You know, their their leading scorer was Drew Holiday at 13.9 points per game. Andre Iguodala, 13.7 points per game. Uh, and then Evan Turner and Luke Williams both averaged about 10 points per game. So uh, not a whole lot of uh, scoring firepower uh, there. Um, you know, uh, on the other side, be Kevin Garnett did was did average 19.7 points per game, so almost 20 points. Um, you know, this was kind of uh, one of his last hurrahs as a, you know, really good playoff player. I mean, they were traded, you know, pretty soon after. So I guess they had another year together and then were traded uh, after, you know, losing to Miami. So. So, um, so yeah, I, I mean, I would definitely be up there. That they're not. Uh, I don't know. They don't have quite the. I, I guess with the fact that you know the Rose got hurt and they, the fact that they beat the Bulls there was kind of a fluke. I don't think of them as much in that way. Although you know they put up a good fight here for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think the other caveat, too, is this was also a lockout year as well. I mean, it wasn't maybe to the extent, but, you know, this was the, the 2011, 2012 lockout. So, right. again, that might have caused it, similar to what you're saying with the Knicks, where it's like, hey, if, if they had played another 20 games, this team may have won 50. Because it's like they came together halfway through the season. You know, it's one of those things where maybe they weren't going to be an eight seed if, if the season was a little bit longer. So I think that's a little caveat to put on them as well. But they don't have the cachet of like some of the other, you know, big playoff upset teams. And, and like you're saying, the Rose injury is one way. But yeah, it would have been pretty funny if they actually did make it to the conference finals here. But uh, they didn't, alas. And that, uh, that was our last matchup of these two franchises until obviously this year. So uh, a big renewal of, of this uh, big time rivalry. So pretty cool to, to see that kind of come back together. Yeah, and this is of course sort of the, the the this was the last time the Sixers were really you know a relevant team. They broke up you know rel- I think they had a disappointing year the next year and then broke up relatively soon after that. And trust the process, and and here they are now. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah. you tell me, Doug uh, Doug Collins coach team started tuning him out and then regressing quickly. <laughs> like, no I, way. It's hard to believe that. Yeah. <laughs> no way. <laughs> uh, I, I'm sure Kwame Brown was just the missing piece. If they bring him in, you know, they were just gonna they were gonna turn around. You know, it was gonna happen, Rich. I refuse this this slander of one Doug Collins. How dare you? Uh, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. There was a quite a few quite a few uh, averaging eighty point uh, games in this uh, series. You know, the the uh, eighty two eighty one in game two, uh, eighty two seventy five in game six, and eighty five seventy five in a game seven. Some real barn burners there. Let me tell you. Yeah, yeah. People, people yeah. forget that this like new fun NBA is not. It's pretty recent. Like it, there was. Yeah. it was still not great around, the, especially in the East. Like there, the West yeah. has always kind of been. The fun, <laughs> I don't know how to a little put more it like fun, that. yeah, yeah, right. like definitely for like the last twenty years, the West has been pretty fun. The East has kind of gone through ebbs and flows. East is getting fun again, which is it, it, yeah. is good, but uh, yeah, the uh, two thousand twelve, not so much fun. So not not quite as much, no. So. <sighs> So next we have the uh, the Pelicans, the Warriors, and their only uh, matchup. Uh, these two franchises, including when the of course the Hornets were in, when New Orleans were, were the Hornets, um, but going back to two thousand and three uh, is uh, twenty fifteen. So even if you counted the real Hornets history or the Bobcats history, they have n- none of those teams have ever matched up in the uh, playoffs. So right, it, it's, not, it's not confusing, Rich. I tell no. you, it's, it's not, it's not, <laughs> one of these days, one of these days, I'm going to say it and then not make a comment. It's just going to be normal. I don't no. know when that day is going to be, but it's going it, to come. It's one of these days. probably not, not going to happen as long as we're <laughs> this podcast. <laughs> it's going to be a while, but it's going twenty years from days. now. We're still going to be uh, confused about how to explain <laughs> right. the history, well, even though everyone probably knows it. But 2018, yeah, right. When you and I are exactly we're doing this podcast in 2030. I don't want to do. But, okay. Uh, anyway, right. fair enough, Rich. Um, that's about twelve years ahead of time. So I don't know. I don't know if you're willing to do twelve years, but not twenty years. That's, that's the dividing line years, for you. Yeah. I, okay. I, I, I can lock in a twelve-year contract. Yeah. I don't know. If okay. That's fair years, enough. Feel, All right. But, it's uh, a hockey contract, but that's that's okay. You know. <laughs> anyway, yeah. uh, this is the second year uh, the Pelicans were the Pelicans, <laughs> the first uh, New Orleans playoff berth uh, since 2011. Again, not confusing at all, anybody, but uh, for the no. Warriors, uh, it was their true coming out party this year. Uh, you're probably familiar with this year. It was the first year for head coach Steve Kerr. That was a good upgrade from Mark Jackson. Uh, the Warriors were first in points per game, first in SRS, first in pace, second in offensive rating, and first in defensive rating. They were pretty good. New Orleans was fine. They were 13th in SRS. Uh, they were led by third-year big man Anthony Davis. This was his real breakout season. I mean, he had averaged 20-plus points per game the year prior, but really excelled this year with 14 win shares. And and he's a guy who, and we've joked about this on the podcast too, there was, up until like last year, they would do like the NBA GM survey, and they would always be like, the breakout stars is going to be Anthony Davis. It's like, he, he can't be any better. Like, he's averaging 27 <laughs> a game. Like, he's he's already broken out. Like, he can't do any more. Like, what do you want from the guy? Like, ah, I think he's really going to break out this year. He's like, he averaged 27 and 15 last year. Like, yeah. That's the best thing you can do. I don't know that he's going to be any better, guys. Like, he's not Wilt. You know, he's right. not going to average 50. You know? right. Like, let's reel right. in. He's, he's pretty good. But yeah. uh, other than Davis, New Orleans, uh, they didn't have a ton. Uh, they had a pretty weird supporting cast. Um, 
Actually, it's pretty much the current Houston Rockets supporting cast. And it's, it's, it's working well for them. But uh, it was Ryan Anderson, Tyreek Evans, Eric Gordon, and Drew Holiday. Uh, but the problem is all of them had dealt with injuries you know, throughout the year and in the playoffs. So it wasn't a fully powered uh, New Orleans Pelicans team. Um, and, yeah, it, it, it kind of went exactly how you think it would go. The Warriors won in four games, which was a surprise to pretty much uh, nobody at all. As mentioned above, the Warriors were pretty good. The Pelicans were just fine. So uh, a little bit about the, the, the regular season of the Warriors, and then we'll kind of get into the playoffs here. Uh, numerous Warriors uh, set individual individual records over the course of the season, and then they've kind of gone back and like rebroke all these records, too, because, the, again, the Warriors are, are good. But uh, Steph Curry won the MVP award. This is the first player since Wilt uh, in the 1960 NBA season to, uh, to win the award. And, of course, the franchise was in Philadelphia. At that point, uh, Curry broke his own NBA record for made three-pointers with uh, 272. He finished with 286. Uh, I forget what his record is now, but it's somewhat I think it's 404. Yeah, right? it's it's, like it's over 400. So, yeah. 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 That's just like, what? It's like, where it just makes everybody else look like complete fools, like everybody else in the rest of the NBA history. But uh, yeah, yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, Clay Thompson broke the NBA record for most points in a quarter in a January game, January 2015. Uh, he scored 37. Uh, he finished the game with 52 points. That was his career high. Uh, Steve Kerr won his 63rd game in, on April 15th, and that was uh, the NBA record for most wins by a rookie head coach. Uh, he would finish with 67. Um, and then Curry and Thompson broke the single season record for most three pointers made by a pair of teammates, which of course they would because. <laughs> Curry is on his own, breaking his own records, but uh, they stink. Uh, 525 three-pointers over the course of the season. The previous record was uh, 484, set by them <laughs> in 2014. So, yes. Uh, by the way, it's 402. And do you want to guess who is uh, number one in, uh, or who, who has the most three-pointers in a season who is not uh, Steph Curry or Clay Thompson? Oh, man. It's someone weird, if I remember correctly. Um, I don't know off the top of my head. Okay, it's Ray Allen, so it's not that weird. Oh, thing. never mind. I thought I thought there was some weird guy in there. Uh, we have like we a, have Dennis Scott is, is so Ray Allen is sixth. Uh, Dennis Scott is eighth. I, okay, and, I think it was Dennis Scott that I was thinking of. That I thought yeah. he was there because I always see the leaderboard. And it's always like Steph and then like yeah. a few other guys. I think it was Scott and, where I was like, oh, I wouldn't assume that he would be up there. But, but yeah, I mean, he was known as a three point shooter, but yeah, just the just number the of attempts yeah, was, was right. much lower there. Yeah, George McLeod also had uh, was is twelfth two fifty seven. So both Scott and McLeod were in the ninety six season when yeah, that was obviously when they shortened the three-point line so oh, right, 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 made a right, difference right. there but anyway so so fun facts there yeah i um before we get into the playoffs the but i kind of remember about the season was the 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 pelicans going down the uh, stretch were really fun to uh, watch I, m- I remember i think there was there was a game late in the season against oklahoma city that was kind of a you know the, the winner makes the playoffs type thing or was you know had had a, a extremely good chance of making the playoffs if that would happen those were the two kind of the two you know chasing for the eighth spot and uh and davis made like an, an incredible Incredible, like distance three pointer, like a buzzer beater type thing. I, I don't think it was. I, I forget if it was a game winner or forced overtime, or it was just you know uh, a, a, a key moment. But it was a really big, you know, exciting time. And I remember it so specifically well that obviously that it made a big imprint on me. But yes, but it was it was a lot of fun. Yeah, from what I remember the most is that it felt like it was the coming out party for not 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 Davis who who was already pretty good, but it, it felt like he was kind of taking the step to superstar. I mean, it felt like the beginning of of a possibility for this franchise because you're looking at all the injuries that what were going on with Anderson and and, and Holiday and Gordon and all those guys, and those are guys that are often injured. So I guess it wasn't like a super big surprise that those guys were hurt, but it still felt like okay, this is you know they're getting this far with all these hurt guys. Once they start getting these guys healthy, once Davis takes even another step up, like this team's here to stay. And I think that's kind of the thing that I always remember is like before this season this was it for the Pelican it was like you know because they've had many issues since then and had that turmoil and obviously the, the, the acquisition of DeMarcus Cousins a bunch of stuff so I remember this being like okay cool this is like they're, they're going to get swept by the Warriors they're going to get killed but this feels like the beginning of what's going to be a, a, a long run for the Pelicans and obviously it, it hasn't been but uh, yeah that's that's kind of one thing I remember that they were a super fun team and it felt like you were watching the, you know the, the coronation of, of a, a, a great team that was come to, that would come to be and it, it just obviously didn't happen that way um, yeah I mean it, I mean they, they have bounced back this year are, are playing well and you yeah. kind of have found something i mean you know how the well they're going to do against the warriors this year was obviously up in the air but um but but yes they, they finally at least shown a little bit of that promise after you know guys dealing with injuries and a little bit of turmoil and you know the them having a lot of problems with with depth and stuff but anthony davis obviously still mm-hmm. being awesome and, and he's really been incredible this year especially and monty williams being their coach for a lot of years stuff this year, they probably didn't know <laughs> things all that much yeah. but uh, about this series uh quickly here the warriors won the first two games pretty easily 
Uh, 34 from Curry in Game 1, 26 from Clay in Game 2. The only close game of the series was Game 3, which is actually a pretty fun game. And, and the good thing is, like, since it's so recent that, you know, if you're listening to this, you can go look up all the highlights on YouTube and see this and whatnot and the full games up there. Really fun game. I would definitely recommend checking it out. I, I kind of remember as I was watching this, I remember watching this game and remembering some of the things from this game. But, yeah, this is one of my favorite games of, the, of these playoffs. Um, the Pelicans were at home, and they, they took the Warriors 2 OT. They fell uh, eventually in, in overtime. Uh, Curry had 40 points and 9 assists, which definitely helped. But, uh, yeah, so the Pelicans, they were up 20 points. 95 to 77, which is eight minutes to go. Uh, the Warriors fired back at the Pelicans appeared to weather the storm. They got back up 101 84 with about. Uh, just just a little under six minutes left. Uh, the Warriors charge back because they're the Warriors, but hey, don't worry. The Pelicans were up 107-103 with 13 seconds left. How could they possibly lose this game? How could they possibly send this to overtime? Not going to happen. Anthony Davis splits free throws, 108-105. Not a big deal. 9.6 seconds left. You're fine. Golden State advances the ball. They find Curry on an inbound pass. He misses his first attempt. Murray Spates gets an offensive rebound, finds Curry again in the corner, falling away in the corner with time expiring, or basically about three seconds left. Curry, of course, hits it because he's amazing and he's great hits it um Tyreek Evans misses a half court heave which is actually very close to which he gets like the Warriors are, are, are they don't want to follow him obviously but they let him get like very close like he's a step away from the three-point line at this point it's kind of a half court heave but but the way he got there it, it's like he's super close to the rim and like it bounces off the back of the rim or whatever anyway uh game heads over time the scored locked at 108 um Curry Began the overtime much like he did in the uh, end of the fourth. Uh, got another three pointer there up 111, 108 with about five minutes left. Uh, Lord, uh, Warriors would get up about six again. New Orleans got pretty close though. They, um, you know, got it to 121, 119. Uh, Curry then got fouled though. Uh, you know, Anthony Davis tried a bunch of shots, kept, kept missing. They just couldn't sink that, that one big shot. Curry, you know, seals it with two, uh, two free throws and that's it. So the Pelicans up 22 with about eight minutes to go or up 20, I should say, with eight minutes to go, then end up losing, um, or nearly 20. Um, and yeah, it just, uh, did not work out well. That was game three for them at home, kind of deflating. Uh, then the Warriors won by 11 in game four. They swept New Orleans. Uh, they then go and dispatch the Grizzlies in six games, the Rockets in five and the Cavs in six to win the NBA title and basically kickstart their dynasty of unrelenting <laughs> power. And, and now the NBA is theirs and everybody else is just looking up to them and dying. <laughs> so that's, yeah. well, that's it. You we'll know. see this year. Yeah, no, this year's pretty fun. We'll see. <laughs> I mean, Cleveland got that one, obviously. So, they, they, you know, they've, uh, the, the the Warriors have, have been, you know, when they are absolutely at their best, they have looked unstoppable and dominant in, you know, victories. I guess really only Steph Curry's health and, you know, some random um, tribulations here and there if you have kept them down. We'll see. You know, the Houston looks pretty good this year, so maybe they'll give them at least a tough challenge, if uh, nothing else. But uh, but yes, yes, this is definitely a, a beginning of something special for the Warriors. How special it will end up being is, of course, uh, is still to be determined. We'll find that out. Uh, completely unrelated notes uh, here for the series. Last little thing. The announced attendance for Game 3 at the Smoothie King Center was 18,444. The announced attendance for Game 4 was 18,443. <laughs> Who was the one person that just was like, oh shit, my Pelicans tickets? Like, yeah. or, or was like, ah, the Warriors got it. I'm not showing up. Screw that. They're like, right. was there one seat that didn't get sold? Was there a seat that got moved? I, I need to know this Maybe one so. difference. What, what was this one? And why did anybody feel the need to actually say it? Like, just just to say it's 444, right? Like, somebody had to be like, nope, it was 443, guys. We got to put that in. But I, I, I'm fascinated by this one person. Uh, or one it's, seat, uh, or one, I don't know, one, one something. If anyone knows, they should let us know. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, if you're it's, in the Smoothie King Center. Please let us know. Yeah, please go but, to the archives. Please let us know. So yeah, figure this yes. out. But, uh, so, yeah, right. I don't know because yeah. yeah, you look at the Warriors' attendance; it's all like whatever their sell, whatever their capacity is. It's just like you know, eight, eighteen thousand, da da da, whatever. This one, one, <laughs> one yeah. difference. I don't know. Who one difference. That's, that's but it must very know. interesting. So. All right. Well, uh, well, I'm I'm puzzled by that. I don't know what to say, but. <laughs> Uh, so we'll move on to our uh, our final uh, playoff uh, series uh, history, the uh, the Rockets and the Jazz, and uh, and this began uh, in 1985. I, I kind of had not really explored this series at all until recently, but it's a uh, it's definitely an interesting one for sure. This is the uh, the second year for the Jazz in the playoffs after they'd missed the, the postseason for their first nine seasons. The, of course, starting in New Orleans and eventually making their way to uh, Salt Lake. Uh, this year, they the Jazz were forty one of forty one. They were thirteen of twenty three teams in SRS. Um, 
They were led by Adrian Dantley, who only played 55 games that year. Uh, they were 20 and 27 at a time, so basically same record they had the rest of the time, but but that may explain why they performed slightly worse than they had the year before. They also Daryl Griffith, we talked about recently, uh, Ricky Green, Thurl Bailey, Jeff Wilkins, and Mark Eaton. And this was uh, pre Carmelo Malone, but, but John Stockton was a rookie here, averaged 18.2 minutes per game during the season, played about the, that same amount in the playoffs, so he was a piece there, but obviously not really. Uh, there was no hint that he he would, of course, become a, a Hall of Famer and a point guard legend um, at, at this point for sure. Yeah, no, no. It's definitely a, it's an interesting team. It's kind of a change in the guard jazz team. It feels, like you said, the, kind of the beginning of what would become the jazz that we know it, but a little bit of the, the, the vestiges of the jazz past or whatever. So it's a, it's a weird kind of blend of the two. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, they, obviously Eaton's there. Um, you know, Ricky Green stuck around for a while. Mm-hmm. Dale Griffith stuck around for a while. You know, they uh, Adrian Dantley would would leave uh, later on. But I mean, yeah, they definitely it, it, they were beginning that transition into the Stockton Malone era. They had no idea that was happening yet, but they you know were uh, were, were going through that. In, in the meantime, the the Rockets were forty eight and thirty four. They were third in the West, ninth in SRS in the league out of twenty three teams. So so pretty good. Uh, this was the first year of the the Twin Towers. The, the uh, Akeem Olajuwon, Ralph Sampson era. They had gone from uh, 29 to uh, 48 wins. This was Olajuwon's rookie year, Sampson's uh, second year. Um, uh, and um, he had, uh, and they'd only won 14 games two years before. So they had a you know, huge turnaround over two seasons. Um, and other key contributors in the team were Lewis Lloyd, uh, John Lucas, who was in the midst of uh, his second of, thir- of three cents with the Rockets. Only a few players have actually done three cents with one team. Um, Rodney McRae, uh, Robert Reed, who was the only leftover from the 81 finals team, uh, Lionel Hollins, who was in his final year in the league, of course, played with the, uh, the Blazers in the 77 title team and the, uh, and the Sixers with a few of their finals teams in the 80s, and Mitchell Wiggins, who's a- Andrew Wiggins' dad, mm. so, um, was a okay player during his day, got, had some drug issues, but, uh, but was effective at times. And, um, yeah, what's really interesting about the series is, uh, you look at the per game, numbers for Elijah Juan and um, and Samson and Elijah Juan averaged 21.2 points uh, and 13 rebounds but he did it on a 49 true shooting percentage and Samson had 21.2 points 16.6 rebounds but had it on uh, 45 true shooting percentage so they really uh, had a you know rough time uh, you know scoring efficiently here despite the gaudy numbers uh, you know obviously Mark Eaton being the you know 7-4 center who you know was it was a, a, a very good, obviously, deterrent in the paint. That was a big part of it. You know, they had um, an interesting collection of uh, big men. Jeff Wilkins played quite a bit in this uh, series. He was kind of a journeyman center, spent most of his career with the Jazz. Uh, Rich Kelly, who was uh, mostly, he, he had played with the uh, New Orleans Jazz. Um, I think he he, had, he was back on the Jazz after a stop elsewhere. Um, and... Um, uh, yeah, he played for Phoenix for a few years, but also played with Denver and then came back to the uh, Jazz. And he, he had been a pretty good player in the uh, 70s, but he was at, at this point was, uh, you know, obviously toward the end of his career. But, uh, you know, so not really necessarily an imposing list of big men, but, you know, they appear to have gotten the job done. Yeah, no, it's 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 an interesting collection of uh, of talent, and yeah, as you mentioned, Mark Eaton is a guy that uh, kind of gets lost in history a little bit because obviously the, the Jazz would become Carl Malone's team and Stockton's team or whatever. But there was a time where, where Eaton was a defensive force. I mean, I think one year didn't he average nearly six blocks a game or something like that. I mean, it, it's pretty nuts. And watching highlights of him, you know, swatting stuff away and just becoming like a, a, a force that really, I mean, uh, almost unmatched at that time too of just being that great defensive center, big bulky guy. Like obviously, you know, in today's NBA, I don't think Mark Eaton uh, gets off the bench, but hey, Mark Eaton was great at that time. But yeah. He kind of gets lost to history because, like you said, he, his big time was in this kind of weird in between point of um, you know the old vestiges of, of of the Jazz, which still in some ways kind of felt like a, they were trying to kind of be an ABA team when they first came in, and, and obviously the, the, the change to New Orleans and the it, it felt weird for a while. And then they finally got stabilized, of course, with Stockton and Malone and Eaton was kind of the, the, the conduit between those, and was you know obviously a, a, an important player during some of the peak you know Malone Jazz years uh, in the late eighties. But really, I mean his his peak came before the team really. Uh, Merge on the national scene, but yeah, a guy who kind of gets lost to history, unfortunately. Yeah, a little bit, yeah, and um, 
Yeah, I, I'm. He, he did average his, his career high was five point six uh, okay, blocks uh, per game, eighty five, which which is close to six. You know, which is which is really high, obviously. Yeah, he led the league in blocks per game uh, four times. You know, was a uh, you know um, an incredible shot blocker, incredible defensive force. It, interesting to think of whether he may have been able to make that transition. I mean, he was uh, he was definitely bulky, but he was seven four two seventy five. I think he could move okay. You know, at least for the era. You know, whether uh, you know yeah, whether a guy like him who shot you know pretty poorly. Um, you know, could have uh, been able to. I mean, he obviously wasn't going to stretch the floor, but yeah. But uh, you know, he may have been able to just be, be big enough and be defensive enough. You know, maybe like 20, 20 minutes per game, you kind of guy. But but still, I mean, he might have been able to do that. It's kind of an interesting thought. Yeah. And the thing that really turned this series around. I mean, it was. Um, it, you know, it was obviously back and forth. The series of five game um, series. The. Um, uh, game one, the uh, Jazz won uh, 115-101 uh, in Houston. The uh, Houston came back and won game two pretty handily. Uh, then the Jazz won game three, 112-104. And then and game four was a, a close win for the Rockets, a 96-94, uh, which... Uh, which leads, of course, to uh, to to Game Five back in Houston again, and uh, the the turnaround here was, and you've probably seen the video clip, and it's um, <laughs> Akeem Olajuwon slapping a Utah Jazz reserve center Billy Poltz, the Whopper, Billy Poltz, uh, ABA legend is a bit of a strong suit, but he was on <laughs> some good good teams in the there, and, and actually he had a uh, in his 15 year career up, up until that point he had made the playoffs every single year. So he was considered a playoff good luck charm. The Whopper, I like the the Whopper. That's like that's definitely like a nineteen forties, you know, baseball player. Not a not a not an eighties basketball player, but hey, it worked out for hey, him. And yeah, I mean, hey, that, that, hey, you can't whopper, mess with the success. Yeah. I mean, put him on your no, team and make playoffs. Whopper. So yeah. I mean, it's it's you know, yeah. So at, <laughs> yeah, at, at that point, the. Um, you know, so so Mark Eaton was hurt during the game, so he 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 went out late in the first half with a hyperextended knee, didn't didn't couldn't return. Uh, so Elijah Wan had 14 points in the third quarter. Houston was up 76 to 67, and then um, and then Elijah Wan he would talk about later how he just felt like uh, Paltz was a flopper, was angry about him guarding really close. What he felt like, and he just he just smacked him in the face, and and yeah, Paltz, nice. you know, I mean, he he you know stumbled a little bit, but wasn't like he didn't really I think his lack of reaction was the thing that just kind of keyed up and it, it seemed to fire his team up and uh, Utah scored 37 points in that fourth quarter uh, Thurl Bailey had 15 points in the quarter and Jeff Wilkins and uh, and Fred Roberts another you know, another big who kind of you know contributed there and John Stockton also all you know it was, it was kind of a bench uh, unit that was able to bring them back and it suddenly just uh, just turned things around and um Paltz's quote was, it just shows what emotion and intensity can do. We played with great emotion down the stretch and it took them out of their pattern. Either Akeem can't punch or I can really take a punch. It wasn't much. Wow, so. <laughs> shade. Paul yeah. the Whopper throwing some massive shade. At I, I know. Oh, Akeem yeah. Lajuan there. That's, uh, that's, that's incredible. Yeah, I've seen the clip. So, it is kind of weird. Yeah, he just kind of like gets slapped and just kind of looks at him like, all right, <laughs> whatever, yeah. dude. Like, I don't care. So, so, so and Paltz would later say, there's there's a, a quote on NBA.com uh, where uh he said, "Hey, if you if I did to you what I did to him, you'd punch me too." Uh, I kept distracting him in the most annoying ways. The ref didn't see it, but it sure bugged him. So, um, yeah, it was just uh, it, it, it was it was just kind of crazy. Um, and yeah, the refs didn't see it either. So Elijah wasn't wasn't thrown out of the game. Like it was just kind of like you know, nobody saw it. Just kind of didn't really do anything. But yeah, Paltz actually uh, he had five rebounds in the quarter, and that was more than Houston had in the entire fourth quarter. So. Uh, <laughs> What you know? That's a that's a that's a fun little story there. Um, and I had like I'd seen the punch before, but I hadn't really uh, realized it was actually in the series. And then looking in the fact that it was such a momentous you know thing for the uh, series, and you know, this was a pretty big disappointment for the uh, for the Rockets. You know, they were expected; they were the third seed. They were expected to you know win this series, maybe challenge the Lakers uh, in th- these playoffs. I mean, there were there were high expectations already for the Twin Towers, and obviously you know they would come to fruition to an extent in the next journey to six. You know, making be the Lakers and making the finals, but um, but yeah, this was a temporary setback for them. 
Yeah, and, and, and Paul, said, we should mention as well that he did play for Houston, but he played prior to uh, to Akeem Olajuwon coming there. So it right. wasn't like they yeah. were former teammates and they had beef back <laughs> then or whatever. I, maybe, I don't know if they did, but no, Paul's played for Houston, but, but, but prior to Hakeem Olajuwon. So, yeah, there was no uh, – yeah. and this was Paul's yeah, yeah. final season in the NBA as well. So we went out right. with, uh, with a bang. <laughs> with a bang, style, yes. Yeah. The Whopper went out with bang, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he played. Yeah, he he, he bounced around. Yeah, he, he played for as we mentioned the Nets. He went, was there for the '74 title. Uh, yeah, played for the Spurs quite a bit in the uh, late '70s on some really good teams there. And uh, yeah, then then the Rockets for some solid teams. And uh, I went back to the Spurs. Yeah, he got the Hawks. He played he played one season for the Hawks and finally have the Jazz there. So interesting stuff. You go ahead. Yeah. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Sorry, I wasn't sure what. To yeah. Take a quick break here and then. All right, then after eight years of no matchups between the two, they uh, became familiar foes again in the mid to late 90s. They faced off uh, against one another four times. We mentioned at the top of the show that I, like, I knew that they'd faced off each other. I guess I just didn't realize it happened as much as it did in 94, 95, 97, and 1998. Uh, this is an interesting little fact. No matter what round it was, uh, twice it was in the conference finals and twice it was in the first round, the end result was the winner made the NBA Finals. So um, yeah. it's pretty cool there. Uh, 94, yeah. 95, of course, the Rockets won both of those series and made their way to the NBA Finals. And then 97, 98, the Jazz, of course, won and made their way to the NBA Finals. Um, real quick, we kind of go over the series. I don't think we need to go in excruciating detail about these. Uh, 94, the Rockets won the first two games in Houston. Uh, they then split the two games in Salt Lake City. Uh, Jazz won the first of the two. Uh, Rockets hit eight three-pointers in the first three quarters to build a 24-point lead in Game 5. Uh, then the Jazz came back in the fourth quarter, cut the lead to eight. Uh, Robert uh, Ory and Akeem Olajuwon. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. And I, I like how eight three pointers in the first three quarters is like noteworthy. In right. Yeah. We're like, <laughs> Curry does that on like a bad day. Like, oh, dude. right. Like, exactly. But, yeah. You know, this it was a big deal. This is like from a game story in the New York Times. Like eight three pointers by the Rockets. Yeah. It's like in, in three quarters. <laughs> what? Right, yeah. Oh my God! That's why they built such a great lead. But don't take those shots. They're very dangerous. Don't do that. No. Yeah. They are very dangerous. Definitely yes. want to bring it down low though. They don't want to take those three. Right. They're kind of wild. Yeah. Post that up. There. Yeah. <laughs> right. You can count on the post up. Yeah. Uh, Robert Ory and Elijah made clutch uh, shots down the stretch. They won it uh, 94-98, claimed the Western Conference title, uh, and they sent the Rockets, of course, to the NBA Finals for the first time since 1986, and they would, of course, go back and win the NBA Championship against uh, Patrick Ewing and the New York Knicks seven-game series. Uh, as well, 95, Houston struggles throughout much of the season. They finish with a record of, uh, you know, 47 and 35, uh, 60 in the West. Uh, the Jazz, they ended a little higher. Uh, they're 60 and 22, then a franchise record. They had a 15 game win streak at one point, um, on the road in December and January. And that was the second longest such streak in the NBA. So Jazz, very good. Houston getting old and, and, and struggling a little bit. But uh, as we know, the series, how it ended, but, uh, the Jazz, uh, barely won the first game, uh, 102, 100, which maybe should have been a, a pure into the future. Uh, Rockets beat the Jazz in game two. One 140 to 126, an explosion in 1990s basketball uh, for the split in Utah. The series then moves to Houston. Uh, Jazz won game three. Uh, Rockets win game four. They force a game five. It, this is the first round, of course, so uh, only five game series. Um, and then, yeah, the Rockets defeated the Jazz 95 91 and eliminated Utah for the second straight year in a pretty uh, close game. Uh, Rockets, of course, went on to repeat as champions and beat the Orlando Magic in the finals and uh, are the lowest seed to win the NBA championship. So good for uh, good for Houston there, but yeah, they were like we said we, we've mentioned a few teams before a team that kind of really got transformed midway through the year, acquiring Clyde Drexler, putting some new life into the team. But uh, yeah, just definitely a team that that didn't necessarily come out of nowhere, but doesn't have the gaudy regular season numbers to sort of that that, that lead you to believe that they would be a title team or whatever. But you know, when it all came together, uh, came together quite well for them, and and yeah, they beat Utah in the first round and moved down to the win the NBA Finals. Yeah, you know, it was interesting. Is you know, you talked about how the Rockets, you know, you know, they they won, of course, the early uh, years in this rivalry, and then they got old. But the Jazz, you know, basically were the same age. Actually, you had more older players, right, right. but <laughs> s- somehow, yeah, those guys just. I mean, it basically, Stockton Malone were age ageless, and you know, Lajuan, Drexler, and Barkley when he came along, you know, had kind of natural age related regression, and you know, in Barkley's case, obviously, the conditioning didn't really help there. But uh, it's funny how, yeah, basically. Basically, both teams were roughly the same age for the most part. Um, the and the the Rockets actually had role players who were younger than they traded most of them away or lost most of them. You know, Ori and um, and uh, and Cassell in particular. So it, it's kind of funny how that uh, that worked out for both teams. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it's kind of funny, but yeah, it's, it, the thing with Carl Malone is like he'd be like thirty eight and like getting better. It's like what? Like no, stop! Like you're supposed to be getting old, but uh, kept himself in great shape. So that uh, definitely and all the WCW wrestling, I'm sure helped. Uh, as yeah, well. yeah, absolutely. You, know, <laughs> sure, you, you train with Rodman. DDP. I mean, it's gonna it's gonna help you out. Absolutely. Right, yeah. 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 Um, 1997, first time in uh, 
uh, franchise history, U- uh, Utah finished as the top Western Conference team, 64 and 18, uh, the best in franchise history. Storm passed both the Clippers and the Lakers. I'd love to see the Clippers <laughs> in the 97 playoffs. That probably was not very good for the old clip show there, but, uh, yeah, the uh, Utah goes to the conference finals, uh, meeting Houston. Um, this, uh, was a pretty fun year as well. Like, this is, this is kind of the year they acquired Charles Barkley, as you mentioned, uh, traded, you know, a bunch of guys, Sam Cassell and Robert Ori, a lot of the young players, like you mentioned. Rockets finished, uh, second in the Midwest and the Western Conference, 57 wins. So they weren't bad. They were, they were a very good team at this point. Uh, the third seed, uh, they swept the Minnesota Timberwolves in the first round, then a seven game series with the Seattle Supersonics, uh, in the semifinals. To get to this point, um, Utah wins the first two games at home. Uh, Rockets respond at home in wins with games three and four. Uh, one of those games, thanks to the heroics of Eddie Johnson, who, uh, yeah, you'll have to look this game up as well. This one's available. 31 points off the bench in game three and his a, hits a buzzer beating game winning three pointer in game four to even the series at two. Awesome game and awesome moment for him. Who's, who's not a, exactly like a great, you know, a, a great player or a guy that anybody really expected. Uh, you know, the key to this game is going to be Eddie Johnson off the bench. Like pretty yeah. nuts there. 31 points. And he's a score, but yeah, yeah no, he was, right. he was fine. But like, I don't know if anybody in that game was like, yeah, you know, with all that talent, like that Eddie Johnson would be the X factor <laughs> when it was sure. all said and done. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, and, and it, it, this game obviously was exciting, but it gets even you know better as the series goes along. Uh, the Jazz win Game Five at home, have a, a twelve point uh, deficit. Uh, John Stockton down the stretch scored fifteen points in the uh, fourth quarter, and uh, and then had a uh, and had a, a big game, big shot at the uh, end of the buzzer as well. So. Uh, so some really that and that that being in game six, of course, they're uh, being able to. Um, or was that? I'm sorry, was that game six or game seven? I'm uh, game six. I'm sorry, that was yes, game, game yeah, six. Game six, correct? Yeah. Yes. So so they so they won game six with uh, Stockton playing well down the stretch, and then in game six he hits the uh, big shot that uh, the dramatic big shot that that you know one of the more famous shots in uh, in Utah Jazz history, probably the most famous shot in Utah Jazz history, I would say. A lot of buzzer beaters around this time. I'm, I'm thinking like you have the Eddie Johnson one there. You have Stockton yeah. winning a buzzer beater to get them into yeah. the finals. You have Steve Kerr, you know, hitting a buzzer beater to to, to win. The, you know, a huge right. game for the Bulls. You got then the next year Michael Jordan's buzzer. Like a big big time for buzzer beaters. Like a lot of uh, yeah. a lot of pretty fun ones there. I guess yeah. there's always uh, buzzer beaters always. But I don't know. It seems like a, a big confluence of, of 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 them around this time. But I don't know. Maybe yeah. We'll have to have somebody do the stats on that. This <laughs> is particularly big time for buzzer beaters. But uh, then uh, 1998. Yeah. Oh, the, uh, oh, one thing, one thing before getting to oh, that. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I'm curious what you think of, in retrospect, the Charles Barkley trade for Sam Cassell, you know, Robert Ory, and Chucky Brown and Mark Bryant. I mean, if they kept Sam Cassell and Robert Ory, like, given what happened in those in their careers, like, <laughs> how good would they have been, you know, like, um, keeping those guys? Like, do you think they would have been a better contender to beat, you know, Utah? Um with you know two younger players who you know kept them a little fresher, kept them a little better. I mean, I'm mean, Charles Barkley was still really really good at this point, so I don't want like underrate what he did. But like I don't know, maybe there's a more balanced team. Maybe you know I don't know. That, that's that's an interesting question right there. It definitely is, yeah, because Cassell would emerge you know in a few years as being one of the top point guards in the league, and and Ori was you know a great role player for the Lakers, but probably would have you know it, had Robert Ori, and I think everybody sort of agree with that. Had he been on a different team in those days, like he's a guy that you could have trusted to had to do a lot more. Of course, he didn't have to do a ton on the Lakers. Except for you know, hit awesome three pointers whenever they needed him. But like you know, when you had Kobe and Shaq and those sort of guys doing it. But uh, yeah, no, it, it's definitely an interesting question because you know more than anything, the depth would have been when there, the, the 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 youth would have been there. The real interesting question is like you know, if if does Scottie Pippen still go there after you know ninety eight, and and does that so how does that sort of work, and how does that sort of you know, I, I don't know, I don't know if that changes yeah. the trajectory of the franchise if Pippen doesn't go there, but I don't know if that was would have been necessarily the worst thing ever if Pippen didn't go. You know, it's it's Except that yeah, at least kind of a chain there. reaction. Yeah. Maybe the new team is just you know Cassell or. Uh, a few other guys, and, and you know, and obviously an aging Hakeem, but who was still pretty, you know, Hakeem yeah. could still put up numbers and do some stuff. Obviously, his, his fall would be coming in a few years. I don't know. It's it's an interesting question. I mean, I get why yeah. they did it. Like, I, I don't think I would say right. no to that trade if I was the Rockets, but no, you do yeah. kind of, in retrospect, look at and see what Cassell became and realize, oh, geez, that would have been pretty good to have that. You know? Yeah, right. Cassell could have been the kind of, you know, a not quite the number one player, but he, he certainly, like, he could be the second or third best player on a really good team. Obviously, he did that with Minnesota, yeah. and, you know, he, he was really, really pretty good for most of his career. Yeah. He got better when he got older, so um, you know maybe that take, would have taken a while. But it's interesting. Yeah, um, Jason Palumbo brought up the idea of just, um, of course, you know, one thing with '97 is they lost, um, you know, Kenny Smith. Uh, he 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 left. He was gone for. He he played on like a few teams that next year and then retired. Um, we, you know, if they had had somebody, you know, other than Maloney to actually, you know, give them good good, good point guard play, maybe that would have certainly, you know, helped them out uh, that time. I don't know if they would have really uh, been able to, uh, 
you know, would have been able to, uh, you know, be the Jazz in the situation. Obviously, the Jazz still the point guard advantage, but that's another interesting what if as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's 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 a fun yeah to see what they would have done and and, yeah. and see how the you but, know, moving parts would have would have quite right. worked for the Rockets. Plus, plus Kenny Smith and Charles Barkley could have played together on a team in their career, right? Which exactly. would add which more you know, to the, the broadcasting. Was, yeah. Little did we know that would be an amazing thing. But yeah, no, it's it's yeah. yeah the Rockets are definitely one of those interesting teams. There, they were kind of just trying to, to latch on to every little bit, and you wonder, yeah, if they maybe had had a little. A little bit more of a, of a tenure, but it, one of the things about that's kind of fun about the Rockets, and you go back and look, is that they've they've really had not had many bottom out years. You know, obviously, you know, in the post Hakeem, the first year, if you're, you know, few post Hakeem years was, were, were bad, but you know, you see, you get Yao Ming, you get Steve Francis, so they kind of get a little mini peak there. Then you get to the Tracy McGrady Yao Ming years. Then there's a little bit of a downtime, and then you get the James Harden, you know, years and whatnot. But uh, yeah, it's just kind of interesting to see that, how that franchise is, is kind of weathered the storm. But you wonder, yeah, they probably could have had a few more years. Uh, of relevancy, but then they don't get Yao Ming, and that was kind of fun. So <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. But the things happen. The the team, but yeah, no, it's it is what it is. But uh, 1998, sure. uh, one last time for these legendary teams. Uh, Jazz finished with uh, tied with the best record with Chicago at 62 and 20, uh, having swept the regular season series against the Bulls. Uh, they guaranteed home court throughout the entire playoffs. Uh, the Rockets are really hanging on to the last little strings of this franchise. They're eight seed. I uh, finished the record of 41 and 41. Numerous injuries throughout the year to every guy. Um, pretty much every guy on the roster. <laughs> at some sort of injury at this point. Like you said, they might have been the same age as the Jazz, but they felt so much older. They felt about 10 years older uh, in general. But um, this is the first round. Not a ton to get into about this one. Not really a great series. Uh, the Jazz win in uh, five games. So they take it to all the way to five games. But uh, So it was a little bit of a scare, but it felt like the Jazz were definitely just the better team. But uh, yeah, I don't know. The Rockets had a nice little little blip here, a little bit, uh, you know, kind of show that they're you know, maybe still a team to be reckoned with. And we would see, you know, then Scotty would go there next year and some other things would happen. But uh, yeah, definitely uh, probably better that the Jazz moved on to, to make it a little bit more competitive. If the Rockets would have won this, it would have uh, maybe led to some pretty bad uh, playoff series uh, coming up. But uh, anyway, yeah, the Jazz win that and move on. They obviously go into the NBA Finals where they lose to the, uh, the Chicago Bulls. And uh, Michael Jordan's final shots uh, of his career, but we uh, we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll maybe talk about that. I don't know if that topic maybe. will come up in the in another Might. podcast series that we do. I, yeah. don't, I don't know. Maybe you know the NBA Finals will come up. I don't know. Much less the last game of uh, Claude Rush's career as well. So, <laughs> right, yeah. so of course. Yeah, the, yeah. the most yeah. important part. So, of- <laughs> uh, I, yeah, uh, most important part to me anyway. That's for sure. So. <laughs> And uh, yeah, then the uh, one more, uh, well, two two series back to back in uh, one more stage of this rivalry, two thousand seven and two thousand eight. First round uh, in both cases, the Western Conference, uh, the Jazz winning uh, both instances, and um, the yeah, it was uh, Tracy McGrady and Yao Ming had you know been brought together with much fanfare. The people thinking this he was really something, a a, a franchise uh, you know combination. Yeah, obviously Yao the premier big man and McGrady you know one of the premier mere uh, wings in the game and thinking that they could you know lead the jazz to or the rockets rather to you know greatness and unfortunately injuries got in the way of that tandem it didn't happen and uh less heralded uh darren williams and carl's booze for the jazz actually led them to some pretty uh good success for um you know over a, a few years in the late uh, 2000s uh and including in 07 they managed to make it to the western conference finals in fact um they uh kind of surprisingly enough that was the year that the warriors had upset the um the mavs knocking them out of the one spot so it made the path a little bit easier for the Jazz but before they got to that point they had to beat the uh, Rockets yeah and um, McGrady uh uh, this, of course, one big thing, of course, at this point and throughout his career is that he was unable to lead his team past the uh, first round. So and, and didn't get a great, great start in game one. Uh, he only scored one point there. But in the second half, he uh, he scored thir- 16 points in the third quarter, finished 23 in the Rockets did actually win game one. Uh, and he said, in, in fact, one game two as well, 98 to 90. Uh, and McGrady and Yao had 31 and 27 points, respectively. Carlos Boozer uh, managed to have uh, 41, which is career uh, tied for his career high so um however the jazz were able to even it up in games uh, three and four as you know as it went back to um utah then back to houston uh mcgrady had one of his best performances uh in the playoffs 26 points in a career 16 assists as they uh, managed to go up three two but the jazz uh were able to bounce back in game six 94 82 and at this point game seven the home team had won every game of the series but the jazz were able to uh edge it out in uh, game seven in houston 103 to and 99 and you know yeah McGrady kind of did their part each had 29 points but uh, Carlos Boozer 35 points and um <laughs> I it was cannot the first- believe there was a time where like Carlos Boozer you know what I mean like I was, I was doing the research of this and I was like yeah there was a time where Carlos Boozer was like a killer like he was he was, was really awesome. good yeah people yeah Carlos Boozer and it's like you know 
I just they, they know became, him as when he went to the Bulls and he kind of lost a lot. But there was a time where Boozer was fucking awesome, <laughs> like really, yeah, really good. I don't, I don't know if he was ever that great of a defender, but it didn't matter. His no, offense was really no, good. He definitely and, was not, but that's fine. They yeah. you were able to build a good defense, you know, around him, or you know, at least yeah. Well, were he was really good enough. at shouting out like who he was supposed to be guarding and that somebody else should be guarding him. So yeah. or, or yelling switch or ah, <laughs> like, you know, like yeah. that guy, that guy, stop him. But yeah, yeah, that's fine. You know, he didn't matter. He was scoring yeah. forty one. Who cares? Yeah, the, the Jazz were actually uh, 18th in defensive rating uh, that year. This was like a 4-5 series, so it was fairly close in record and everything and in quality. They were slightly better, 12th in defensive rating the next year. But yeah, not, Diva's out their calling card at that, no, that, at uh, that point, which not probably hurt them in the playoffs because no, they were they were a better regular season team than they were a playoff team, although they obviously made the conference finals right. this year. But they always looked like they might be a threat to beat the, the Lakers, and the Lakers pretty much smashed them every time they played in the playoffs. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, in 2008, uh, the, uh, the now the Rockets did have home court advantage, but unfortunately Yao Ming had suffered a uh, a, a stress fracture injury during the season, so they were not at uh, full strength. Obviously, uh, th- was this the year that Houston won 22 games in a row? Um, I'm trying to remember. I, I believe I it was. I think so. Yeah. I believe it's yeah with like the ragtag team of like you know like Jawan right. Howard is like the lead. yeah I believe this is the year, but I I, I don't know 100. percent We can find uh, that pretty quickly. All right, we'll, we'll look that up while we t- talk about the game. But um, yeah, so uh, the the Jazz won the first two games, and Houston looked like they were going to uh, probably uh, you know come back home, maybe sweep the Rockets. But the Rockets did play uh, well in Game Three. Uh, Carl Landry blocked Darren Williams' uh, attempted uh, game winning shot and uh and were able, they were able to hold them off um in uh jazz did win game four took a, a 3-1 lead uh and uh and game five the rockets uh, did outplay the jazz to be able to uh at least you get back to 3-2 but game six uh Trish mcgrady had 41 points so did, did play well in the playoffs at least in this series but uh the, the Rockets. Uh, so at this point, Ray for Alston also was uh, injured in the series. So and, 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 I, you're uh, not going to win if Ray for Alston's hurt. Like you're done now, right? I mean, no, now yeah, you, you, you can weather the Yow storm, but you're not weathering the Ray for Alston. <laughs> No, absolutely when, when not. Skip to my Lugos down. It, your season's over. This was indeed no, the year that they you might as well just skip the season so. because it's not going <laughs> right, to happen. You know? Right. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so yes, it was not a. Um, it, it was. It was. Uh, it was struck. See, this was the year that they won 22 games. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, there you go. So yes, um, yeah, that was fun. I, for, I kind of forgot about the winning streak. That that was a uh, uh, that, that was a great. That, that was just pre Twitter, but that was like a where there was kind of like more of like an online environment. There were blogs and stuff, and there was kind of the you know kind of a mer- like it was pre Twitter existing or maybe Twitter existed and but no one was using it yet. But it was it was kind of there was still kind of that basketball you know whatever basketball Twitter became it was kind of like in the air during that time. So right, yeah, like the the comment section of random like free Darko right. and, and then like you know random blogs sure yeah ESPN live chats this. and yeah, right, bought right. a lie and yeah that, that kind of thing so yeah that was a fun time the good old days yeah before you know yeah. But, uh, then again our, our, our little corner of uh, basketball Twitter is fine so I don't know yeah <laughs> I you know I honestly like yeah you 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 block pretty much people who are annoying don't follow anybody annoying and it's usually going to be okay unless you get to you know now some people just kind of get harassed or some people are very big and very famous and, and can't kind of you know block out that noise but uh, but for us we don't have to deal with it too much and i i like what we've uh i like the things that we've built and the the stuff that we're with it's all usually pretty good and pretty positive so yay that would kind of stink if there was like a weird like nba history everybody hates each other twitter like you know what i mean right. like if, if yeah. like curtis Harris was just like shut the hell up you guys are wrong like get off my lawn you know what i mean like right that'd be i mean it'd be really weird if like we're like oh yeah that guy's kind of a jerk like and then curtis is gone nothing everyone's no. everyone's awesome so yeah we got a nice little yeah. little corner of our uh our don't ruin it, people. Don't don't start following no. us. You know, no, right. Yeah. Although, yeah, somebody so somebody left us a one star review on um, iTunes. So if you uh, want to uh, counteract that uh, person and uh, leave us a, a five star review uh, on iTunes and uh, and yeah, a rating and review would be uh, awesome. We would greatly appreciate that. So you can uh, you can do that. You can uh, also uh, find us on uh, Stitcher or uh, TuneIn or Google Play or you know pretty much anywhere where you listen to your podcast. We are on there. And if you want to leave us ratings and reviews. On any of those places that would uh, greatly uh, make us feel good and will uh, w- w- help our average on uh, iTunes, which has been reduced by this uh, one uh, terrible person who I uh, <laughs> I, I, I do you know I, what I they said. Uh, do you know what they said? I can't. They, I can't. They, see they, it. they didn't. They didn't say anything. They just left a rating. So oh, I have no you idea. Mean yeah, it. you know that's yeah. the worst. You know, at least tell yeah. us. You know, tell us what we did yeah. wrong. That's- right. So anyway, so yeah, so that happened. Uh, you can also find us on Twitter and Facebook at Over and Back uh, NBA. Uh, anything else, Rich? 
I think that's it. Yeah, I'm pretty. Uh, this has been a very fun playoff series, and I'm glad we could kind of meld a little bit of the the, the current going ons with the uh, with the history, and we might have that a little bit more as as the playoffs kind of wind on. Yeah, as well. Yeah. We have another a few things planned, and and one thing is is uh, you know if if. We're taking a risk here that LeBron is going to have a good game again in these playoffs or that like LeBron will still be good uh, in another few weeks. So if those two things stay true, then we have another fun show coming up in a little bit. But Yeah, and even if it's not true, there, he has had good performances in the yeah. past that we can talk about. <laughs> so I think run, either way it'll be relevant. Yeah. yeah, no, so that's good. I always like around these playoff series, we, tie, we try to, you know, around playoff time to meld a little bit of the, the, the current in with the historical. So I always like it doing that, and this was a fun one yeah. uh, uh, this week. So it, yeah, I enjoyed it it's, a lot. Yeah, it's fun to do that. We've we've been better about it at certain points than at other points, but it's uh, it's fun. People seem to respond to, to that uh, even a little bit more. So hopefully you enjoyed the show and have been enjoying the show uh, for, for a long time. So thanks, everyone, for listening. Whether you're a new listener or a longtime listener, we appreciate you, and we'll be back again soon. 